Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries. In John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This will be part four of Hid and Hidden. And uh, by the way, the book I'm going to write is not going to be for sale. It's going to be, I'll just post the stories and, uh, you know, best thing if somebody decides they want to make a book out of it, well, just copy it and then take it to somebody and print it or whatever. So uh, that's all, you know, and I've got over 1,500 Bible studies out there for free downloads. So, uh, you know, if I'm not putting out anything new, I got a lot of old stuff. So this, uh, Go to your King James Bible. Go to Colossians. We're going to read chapter 1. Colossae was a city-state in Greece. And Paul was preaching to the Greeks, which is what the New Testament was written in. But uh, people don't want you to know that. And they want you to think, oh, well, you know, Jesus' real name is Yeshua. Uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so at all. So, all right, with that in mind, let's read Colossians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God and Timotheus, our brother. And right off the bat, people will say, oh, Paul is a self-proclaimed apostle. Well, you know what? If Paul's not an apostle... What they're going, what they have to do is claim that the book of Acts is wrong, since the book of Acts records the conversion of Paul and that the Holy Spirit failed, the Holy Spirit failed to warn the ten apostles that Paul was a wolf in sheep's clothing, infiltrating the flock to destroy the church from within. But they won't come out and say that because, you know, they, they have to deny the book of Acts. So you're not just deleting Paul's writings when you deny Paul. You're deleting the book of Acts, too. And you're charging the Holy Spirit with failure to warn the, the, uh, the other ten apostles. So, you know, you want to throw away Paul's writings, you got to throw away the book of Acts, too. But uh, there's nothing too evil for these people. Nothing. They are absolutely no good in them at all, my opinion. And if you throw away those that Jesus sent, well, <laughs> eventually you end up throwing away Jesus. Because Paul was sent by Jesus. Verse 2. To the saints and faithful Faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love which ye have to all the saints. For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, hope laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel. Gospel means good news. Reconciliation back to God through the blood of Christ is good news, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Verse 6. Which is come unto you, as it is in all the world, and bringeth forth fruit, you know, your works. You know, we're not apple trees. We don't have apples. We're down here in Florida. We have orange trees, or at least we used to before they cut them all down to house all the, uh, well, all the aliens. 
And now we're not talking about people from Mars. So, which is coming to you as it is in all the world and bringeth forth fruit as it doth also in you since the day ye heard of it and knew the grace of God in truth. As ye, have, uh, as ye also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love of uh, your love in the Spirit. For this cause, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled, be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Yeah, this sounds like a real wolf in sheep's clothing. Yeah, doesn't it? Yeah. You know why they, they, you know, the reason they hate Paul was because Paul gives you a lot of warnings about the um, end time man of sin, the son of perdition. Some people say the Antichrist, others say the beast of revelation, the dragon, the beast, the false prophet. Yeah, Paul gives you a lot of warnings about the end times. And they don't want you to read Paul's writings and they want you to think all that happened in 70 AD when Jerusalem was destroyed. And this present wicked world is Christ's kingdom now reigning and ruling in your heart. Uh, yeah, I don't think so. But that's what they want you to think. So you got to ask yourself, did the Antichrist show up in times past or is he to, for the future because if they can convince you he came in the past and he shows up in the future and your pastor says oh even Christ has come don't worry about it worship his image take his mark 666 you know heresies a pastor that I really one of the only pastors I respect always said that heresies have consequences. If somebody can convince you that the Antichrist came in times past and now we're waiting for Christ to show up and the Antichrist shows up and you worship the Antichrist as Christ because somebody convinced you and you take his mark, bad news, people, bad news. You know, that's why they, they always throw out all these flavors of heresies. If they don't get you with one, they'll get you with another. And by no means do I claim to have it all figured out. I don't. Now, there's a lot of things I don't understand. That's why I've never done a commentary on the book of Daniel. It's hard. But one day, uh, the Lord, uh, the angel, one of the angels of the Lord said that the book would be sealed up till the end when the end happens we'll find out one of the minor prophets says that uh, the lord will pour out his spirit upon all flesh one day i forget what book that is but yeah one day we're gonna know but today ain't that day at least not for me so verse 10 that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And that's what we're trying to do, right? Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience. Oh, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now, right? Yeah, that's something that I'm having to work with. Well, work on. Unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness 
Long suffering. <laughs> that means suffering for a long time. And we're supposed to be joyful about it. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, which for which ye also suffer. Hmm. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, uh, it's, this is an interesting thing. When uh, Peter and the apostles were arrested by the Sanhedrin, you know, the, the, the you-know-who's court, and then they were talking about killing these guys. So let's read Acts chapter 5. Uh, let's see. Let's go read Acts chapter 5 verse 27. And when they had brought them, Peter and them, they set them before the council and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not straightly command you that you should not teach in this name? And that name is not Yeshua. No, the name was Jesus. That was the name they said don't teach in. And behold, ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. So we told you, don't you teach in this name. You have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and you're intending to bring this man's murder and pin it on us. Well, <laughs> you know what they say. If the shoe fits, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, not Yeshua, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Who's this ye? Who did, whom ye slew and hanged on a tree? Paul's not in a Roman court here. No, who's he talking to? The Sanhedrin. Verse 31, Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Did these people want to repent? No. And we are his witnesses of these things, and so is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. Was the Sanhedrin obeying the Lord? No. And when they, the Sanhedrin, heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. Hey, we're going to kill these guys. We're going to get rid of them. We got rid of Jesus. Now let's get rid of these guys. Verse 34. Then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel. Paul even said he studied under the Gamaliel. Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. Now, I don't know if you know it, but uh, you go to college for four years, you get a bachelor's degree. Go for two more years, you get a master's. Go two more years, you know, eight years total. You get a PhD, a doctorate, a doctor of philosophy. Yeah. This guy was, well, he was a doctor of the law. I'll guarantee you he had studied, he knew the Torah, the Bible, in, the Old Testament inside and out. I'll guarantee it. This guy knew his stuff. So Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people. So he, this guy had a good reputation and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Hey, uh, you guys stand over there in the corner. I'm going to talk to these people privately. And he said to them, ye men of Israel, take heed to yourselves. Pay attention. What? Listen to me. Pay attention. Take heed to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. 
For before these days rose up Thutis, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about four hundred, joined themselves, who was slain, and all as many as obeyed him, were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people. After him, he also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, Refrain from these men and let them alone. For if this counsel or if this work be of men, it shall come to naught. Yeah, if the apostles' work is of men, it's going to come to nothing. Verse 39, but, but, you know, goats love to butt, right? But if it be of God, ye cannot overthrow it lest haply ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they had called the apostles and beaten them. But, but, Chaplain Bob, uh, uh, we got the pre-trib rapture. God would never do this to the church. Why, the church is God's bride, and God's not a wife beater. Wow. I guess the book of Acts is wrong, huh? If you listen to the that crowd. But listen to this. And to him, Gamaliel, they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach? No. They commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they beat him, said, don't you, don't you say that name, Jesus. We hate that name. And they let him go. And they, Peter and the apostles, and they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. Wait a minute, they just got beaten. Rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And that name is Jesus. You see, these, back in the Old Testament times, they were rejoicing that they had gotten beaten and were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. They taught Jesus, not Yeshua HaMashiach. And you watch, Yeshua is going to be the Antichrist. You watch. The Bible plainly teaches that the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast, comes first before Jesus. But you'd never know that going to a Baptist church, for the most part. All right. Uh, let's go back to Colossians chapter 1. Verse 10, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, unto all patience, and long-suffering, suffering, long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us to meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Just remember, Jesus is that light, right? Verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, spiritual darkness, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son? You know, Paul was on his way to Damascus in the daytime, and a bright light struck him. Yeah, he was in daylight, the physical light. But guess what? He was in spiritual darkness until the light of Christ struck him blind. Yeah. But they don't want to believe that stuff. So, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And if you read the book of Exodus, what did they put on the doorpost? The lentil of the house? 
the blood of the lamb. If you had the blood of the lamb on your lent on the the doorpost, the lentil of the the doorpost of your house, the angel of death, the death angel passed over your house. He didn't go into your house. Oh, there's blood there. The book of Leviticus taught the priests to take the blood for the covering of sin. It didn't wash it away. It covered it. You know, it's... But you uh, look at some of the modern Bible versions. Boy, they guess the blood is one of those words they delete a whole bunch of times. They will delete that word many, many times. And of course, they'll say, well, the King James Bible adds those words. Well, I don't think so. I think they delete it. But they'll, you know, the devil's always doing the opposite. The devil was the original fact checker for face, fas Facebook or fake book. Yeah. You know, in, in the garden... You know, the serpent said, you shall not surely die, Eve, if you eat of this fruit, no problem. God's, nah, he's lying, you know. I, fact checkers have checked this and proven it false. Yeah. In whom we have redemption. What does it mean to redemption? It means to be redeemed. You know, let's say you had something. You were short of money and you had something of value. Maybe a, a wedding ring or something. And you were like, oh, dude, I need some money bad. So you take it to the pawn shop and they give you a ticket and some money and they keep the ring. And if you don't redeem the ring within a certain amount of time and pay the extra money, you know, pay the money they gave you plus extra, uh, you lose the ring. But if you go there, and pay what they gave you and the extra money, you can redeem the thing that you pawned. That's why when you watch uh, porn stars, I mean pawn stars on uh, what used to be the History Channel, uh, they always ask, oh, do you want to pawn this or sell it? And if you want to pawn it, well, you got the opportunity to get it back after a certain period of time. So, do you want to be redeemed? Do you want redemption through the blood? We were sold under the bondage of sin and death. But Christ, in whom we have redemption, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Verse 15. Who is the image? Who is the image? Who is the image? Christ, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. And don't fall for the Jehovah's Witnesses. It'll tell you that Jesus was, had a beginning. Yeah. Oh, well, Jesus was born. Yeah. So he's the firstborn of every creature. They want you to think that, you know, we were... Uh, he's just like us or like the Mormons. They teach that Jesus and Satan are brothers, which means that their, their savior is Satan's brother. Do you want Satan's brother as your savior? Uh, not me. I'm going to pass on that deal. So Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, See, Christ did have a beginning in the human flesh when he was born of a virgin. Yeah. But he existed far before that. Verse 16, it puts a nail in that coffin. For by him, Christ, for by him were all things created. Did you know that Christ was the creator? For by him were all things created that are in heaven that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. And 
Bible scholars will tell you that thrones, dominions, principalities, and powers refer to rankings of angels. So, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. Yeah, Christ, he is before all things. And by him, all things consist. Yeah. Oh boy, this is, uh, turn to John chapter 8. I could read this whole thing, but uh, this is considered the most uh, hateful chapter in the New Testament, according to the, well, you know who. Yeah. Let's see. Let's go to verse 51. Verily, verily, I say unto you, if a man keep my sayings, saying he shall never see death. Now this is Jesus speaking. Then said the you-know-whos unto him, Now we know that thou hast a devil. Abraham is dead, and the prophets. And thou sayest, if a man keep my saying, he shall never taste of death. Art thou greater than our father Abraham? which is dead, and the prophets are dead, whom makest thou thyself? Jesus answered, If I honor myself, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his sayings. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then said the you-know-whos unto him, Thou art not yet fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? Jesus say, said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now remember, Moses, when Moses was in the desert and the Lord, well, the, the burning bush, and Moses said, well, hey, uh, hey, Lord, uh, when I go back to Egypt, you know, Israel's going to ask me, uh, well, what's this guy's name? Well, what am I going to tell him? He says, tell him, I am have sent you. He said, I am that I am. Tell him, I am hath sent you. So when Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am, Jesus is comparing himself to the burning bush, the Lord speaking out of the burning bush to Moses. Verse 59. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself. Jesus hid, hid himself, and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. Now remember, this Bible studies on hide, hid, hidden, you know. There you go. Jesus hid himself. Hmm, I wonder how he did that. Very interesting. Let's go read Exodus chapter 3. Now, Mos verse 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the, bur or the bush is not burnt. Hmm. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. 
And he said, Draw not nigh thither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And if you're ever wondering what name to use, uh, you could always say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And I will guarantee you the God of heaven will know who you are addressing. No problem. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmaster, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and bring them up out of the land unto a good land, and a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. See, Satan's kids knew where the promised land was, so they moved in. They're squatters. And this, uh, this world order thing that they're trying to do, well, they're trying to do what they did back in the past. So, verse 9. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Now, if you look up Egypt, Egypt was one of the areas where the children of Ham, the father of Canaan, of the Canaanites, where they um, populated. But that's another, that's another Bible study altogether. Egypt is never talked about nicely in the Bible that I can find. Uh, I can't find it. If somebody else can find it, please let me know. Send it to me. I'll. But I, I can't find anywhere where Egypt is favorably spoken of in the Bible. Never. So, now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is coming to me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Uh, and by the way, during the time of Joseph, the rulers of Egypt were not native Egyptians. They were a, uh, I think they're called Hiskos, H-Y-S-K-S-O-S, -S or something like that. Uh, they were ruling Egypt in the days of, of Joseph. And from what I understand, they were Semitic cousins of Israel. So when... Joseph was given a wife from, I think it was Potiphar, maybe, I'm, memory, you know, my old memory's getting fuzzy sometimes, but um, he married a, one of the priest's daughter, I'm sure she was a good-blooded of Shem, the chosen seed, that's my guess, so, Verse 11, so God's getting ready to send Moses to Pharaoh. Verse 11, and Moses said unto God, Who am I, who am I, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee, that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. Okay, the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you. And they shall say to me, What is his name? Oh yeah? The God of our fathers sent you to us? Well, what's his name? What shall I say unto them? 
you know, they're going to ask me, well, what's your name? What am I going to tell them? That's the Bob translation. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. See, when Jesus said, I am, <laughs> the you-know-whos knew exactly what Jesus was saying. They, they didn't misunderstand anything. And Jesus didn't correct them, saying, oh, no, 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 you got it wrong. I'm not comparing myself to the I am of the Bible. No, he was saying, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Oh, yeah. They understood perfectly what Jesus was saying. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever. Hmm, I am. There's another good name to call him. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial unto all generations. Oh, yeah. Do you get it? I think I do. All right, let's go back to... Colossians chapter 1. Let's start in verse 16. 15. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. What does preeminence mean? It means to be the, the top of the top. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The fullness of the Father dwells in Christ. And having made peace through the blood, the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say, whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometime alienated, what do you mean alienated? If a husband and wife are alienated, they're, you know, oftentimes separated. You know, you ever hear people say, well, yeah, we're married, but we're separated. They're alienated. And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled. We were alienated from God. We were enemies in our mind by our wicked works from God. Yet now by the blood of Christ, ye now hath he reconciled. In the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. If, well, there's that if, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister. Who, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you? What do you mean suffering, Chaplain Bob? God, God, God loves his bride. He's not a wife beater. God would never let us suffer and get beaten. And, you know, God, God's not a wife beater. No, God's not, but the devil is. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my body, for my, uh, in my flesh, for his body's sake, which is the church. 
Do you know how much Paul suffered for the faith? Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. We'll go verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundant. In stripes above measure. In prisons more frequent. In deaths oft. Of the you-know-whos, five times received I forty stripes, save one. See, they would... Uh, if you don't know what a stripe is, if you take a whip and strike somebody in the back with it, it will leave a mark, like a stripe. You know, a zebra has stripes. Yeah, yeah. And guess what? Paul got 40 stripes, save one. So he got 39. Do you know you can... People die. People died from getting whipped. Five times Paul was whipped 39 times. And I will guarantee you it didn't tickle. And these devils dare, dare. All the sufferings Paul did had to endure, and they dare to call him a false apostle. Verse 25, thrice, three times, was I beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. And no, he didn't get a CBD card. Thrice I suffered shipwreck, a night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Yeah, I know about false brethren. Yeah, Paul suffered for the faith greatly. The Yeshua crowd never suffers nothing. They didn't know, nobody that I know of in Yeshua crowd has ever died for their faith. Zero. Never. So, Colossians 1, 24. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery, the mystery, which hath been hid. Well, that's what this Bible study is all about. The hidden, the hidden mystery, right? Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known, that is, the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, if, if Satan had known that kill, crucifying Christ was going to redeem mankind... Israel, his people, God's people, God's people, his people, not the devil's people. I mean, if they would have known that, they never would have killed Christ. Never. Wouldn't have done it. But when they crucified Christ, a Roman soldier took a spear under his ribs and poked him, put a hole in him, side, and what came out? Water and blood. Water and blood. Oh, yeah. We're redeemed by his blood. I think I did a whole study on just blood, if anybody's interested. But if you go to the NIV, the not inspired version, uh, the word blood is missing a lot of times. So, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. 
All right, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Just turn a page or two, right? Verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, for ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. Yeah, we should be you we should die in the flesh and be alive in the spirit. Verse 4. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Oh, wait a minute. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear? Well, if you listen to people that say everything happened in the past, Christ already appeared. But I don't think so. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Did we appear in Christ in glory? No, I don't think so. Verse 5. Mortify. What does mortify mean? You ever heard of a mortician? A mortician, you know, a funeral home guy. You know, deals with dead bodies, right? It has reference to death. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. You know, the, the fleshly desires we should kill. They should die. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence and covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness. I remember when I was uh, a 20-something-year-old, I loved Mercedes 450 SLs, a, uh, especially uh, the, uh, the uh, what are you, convertible, <laughs> ragtops we call them. Yeah, I love those things. I thought, everybody said, oh, yeah, that's a woman's car. I was like, yeah, dog. I have me one of them. I'm going to have me a lot of women. But, uh, yeah, Lord didn't see fit to give me one. You know, Janis Joplin, a uh, famous singer, horrible voice. She said, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? She must have been talking about Satan because, uh, yeah, uh, never mind. Janis Joplin, Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? Uh, yeah, I think I'd rather have Christ, but uh, yeah. And for those of you that don't know it, the Webster's 1828 Dictionary got, uh, website is back up. Concupiscence, noun, Latin, to covet or lust after, to desire. Um, an unlawful desire of sexual pleasure, uh, coveting of carnal things, worldly goods. Um, there you go. Yeah. Uh, let's see. He even quotes Romans 7, 8. Sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. Romans 7, 8. You know, Ro Noah Webster, what a guy, man. This, this guy knew like over 20 languages fluently. I mean, this guy, he knew biblical Hebrew. He knew hi biblical Greek, the New Testament. Uh, he standardized the spelling of English, at least in the United States. And he spent years putting together the um, dictionary, years of his life. And you know, he, he died pretty much poor, poor because of all the labor he did. Tesla did the same thing. Uh, Nikolai Tesla wanted to give everybody free things and, and gifts to free, you know, electric and everything else. And every penny he made, he devoted into it. Matter of fact, Tesla wouldn't even get married. He says, well, you know, if I get married, I won't have time to work on my science projects. I mean, you know, if it had been up to Tesla, we would have had free electricity. You wouldn't have a, a, a an electric bill every month, but uh, the powers that be wouldn't allow that. So, 
Yeah. All right, let's go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Yep, if you want the things of this world more than you want the Lord, um, it's idolatry in a way. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. And that was me in high school. In the which ye also walked some, uh, some time when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these. Get rid of these things. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another. Uh, believers should not lie to believers. Uh, believe it or not, in the book of Exodus, um, the midwives, the Hebrew midwives were commanded by Pharaoh to kill all the male Hebrew children. And Pharaoh called them up and says, why, why are all these boys being born? I told you to kill them all. Well, the Bob translation. And they said, well, you know, you, the Hebrew women are lively. They're born before we even get there. They lied to Pharaoh. They were not going to kill the, the boys. They weren't going to do it. We're not going to do it. And the Lord blessed them with a house, at least one of them. But the Lord blessed them. They lied to Pharaoh. You're allowed to lie to the devil. The devil will lie to you, and you're allowed to lie to him. So, verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, you know, your new man in Christ, which was renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him where there is neither greek nor jew circumcision nor uncircumcision hebrew roots people say oh well we got to be circumcised that's another reason why they don't like paul they want to bring you into the bondage of the law the law never saved anybody i mean the law would show you were obedient but it, the law didn't save you there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God. Who are the elect of God? Christians. Christians are the elect of God, not the Antichrist over in the Middle East that reject Jesus. Unless you go to a demon nominational 501c3 business claiming with the name church in it, that's no more a church than Federal Express as part of the federal government. It's just a name. And one day they'll get theirs. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. Boy, that's a hard one. And even Jesus told us to forgive. Boy, that's not an easy thing to do, is it? Nope. And above all these things, put on charity. Uh, that word charity is uh, sometimes translated as love. Because if you've got love for your fellow man and you see them in need... You know, it's cold outside, and they don't have a coat. I mean, wouldn't you grab a coat that you, you know, you got a coat you haven't used in five years? Wouldn't you grab it out of your closet and give it to them? That's love. Or you see somebody hasn't eaten in three weeks. Wouldn't you give them a plate of food? I mean, that's love. That's charity. Charity is love, and love is charity. And above all these things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness or perfectness and let the peace of god rule in your hearts to the which also you're called in one body and be ye thankful that's there's only one body but if you listen to the so-called churches they'll say well you know there's a jewish body and then there's the christian body uh no there's only one one lord one faith one baptism that's it 
Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Well, if I was singing, it might be grace, but uh, it would be more like a joyful noise, but yeah. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Oh boy, when I used to do weddings, this verse 18, would a, a bride would never ask me to read this. Never. Well, I can't say that. There was actually one or two out of the hundreds of weddings that I performed. But uh, listen to this. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. But verse 19, they wanted me to read. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And I always told them, well, 18 and 19 are a package set. I can't break it up, you know. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. And think about it. Who gave children unto the parents? The Lord. So he wanted us to be obedient children. Just like when we grow up, he wants us to be obedient children to him. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service, as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing, fearing God. See, if you're a servant to somebody, God allowed it or yeah, so we should, to honor the Lord, we should honor our masters. And whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that the Lord, that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of your inheritance, for ye serve the, serve, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons." Let's read Revelation chapter 6, and we'll close this out. Verse 1, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. And we covered this a little bit in the last previous study on this series. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And the Bible talks about the great red dragon, and the dragon is called the devil and Satan. And what color is... Uh, the color of communism. Red. Aren't communists called reds? Oh yeah. Uh, communism took peace from the earth. They, communism's murdered millions, all untold multiplied millions. And there was given unto him a great sword. Now I'm not saying this red horse is communism, but you know, possibly is. I'm not saying it's not either. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. A measure is like a loaf of bread. And what is a penny? A penny was a... Um, day's wage back then for an unskilled laborer. You know, when I was a kid, you could get three Tootsie Rolls for a penny. Yeah, seriously, three of them. That's what we always did. We went to the 7-Eleven and got candy, candy bars for a nickel. Well, not Mounds and Almond Joy. They were actually seven cents. And then if you had three pennies, well, it's not enough to buy a candy bar, but hey, I can get some Tootsie Rolls. 
So I remember this stuff. You know, somebody give me a dollar. I was like, wow, that's 20 candy bars. Or you could go to the the uh, cinema, the theater, and watch stupid Hollywood garbage. So, a loaf of bread for a day's wage. Think about that, people. Think about that. That's coming. That's coming. This whole thing in Ukraine is just a diversion. It's going to be an excuse. It's all Putin's fault. Or it's all Biden's fault. Or it's, yeah, whatever. Verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked. And behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and the beasts of the earth. Uh, fourth of the earth. Do you know that's around, that's around two billion people, about, more or less. And if you don't know it, a billion is 1,000 millions. So you're talking around 2,000 million dead. Matter of fact, let me look up the population approximately. All right, uh, according to one site, Worldometer, they say it's 7.9 billion, rounded up to eight. 7.9 to eight, yeah. Uh, China alone is one and a half billion. India has 1.4 billion. Wow. Yeah, think about that. Hmm. That's a lot of dead people. So, to kill with war, hunger, starvation, famine, and death, probably disease, and with beasts of the earth, yeah, I wonder if they're two-legged beasts. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Hmm. You ever hear somebody say soul sleep, that when you die, you, you're, it's like you went to sleep and you don't know what's going on. But the Bible says that he, they saw the under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried. Who? The, the dead souls of them that were slain. And they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? See, these are the souls of the people that were died for the faith. They don't have their resurrected bodies yet. That doesn't happen until Christ returns. At the last trump, at the end of the tribulation, there is no pre-trib rapture. It doesn't happen. It's a false prophecy so that you'll lose your faith. And that's going to happen to a lot. How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? Hey, God, they killed, these people killed us. When are you going to give them payback? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. You know, until the last person in the tribulation who dies for Christ happens, there's not going to be the resurrection. And people say, Chaplain Bob, I'm confused. Where's the rapture and the resurrection? Well, you were confused before you talked to me. <laughs> I'm just pointing it out to you. You know, until the last person who's supposed to die in the tribulation for the faith of Christ happens, 
Christ will not return before then. It's not going to happen. Christ returns one time at the end of the tribulation. When the last person dies, we meet him in the air. And if we don't meet the Messiah in the air, it's the wrong Christ. That's a very important point. If you're not if you're not taken up into the sky to meet Christ in the clouds, it's the wrong Messiah. It's the wrong one. And that's when you'll get your resurrected body, when Christ returns, not before. Doesn't happen. Verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. So, when the sun goes dark, it's getting close. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it's rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. That's going to be one heck of an earthquake, people. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves. Yeah, they're going to hide themselves. They hid themselves. That's what this Bible study is. Hid, right? Hidden? Hide? Yeah. They're going to play hide and seek. But the Lord's going to seek them. They're not going to hide. So they're going to, they hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? And the answer to that is nobody that's not in Christ. Nobody that is not in Christ is going to be able to stand up against the Lord. None. Right now, the Lord's playing with these devils like a mouse that's been caught by a cat and the cat will you know play with it and let it loose let it run and then pounce on it and then play with it and then let it loose and then let it run and then pounce on it it's like a cat playing with a mouse does that mean that the mouse is going to win no no until the time that the cat is bored and then bites it in the head and it's dead. Yeah. Right now the Lord's just playing with these people. But there will come a day when the Lord says, well, uh, well, Father will tell the Lord Christ, I've had enough. Go get your bride. Go get my church. Go get my people. I think they've suffered enough. The last person who would, who, who would be saved will it's time to set up the kingdom. But until that day happens, we're going to suffer in this world. So, I guess this is sort of like a, a testing ground, I guess you could say. The Lord's going to see who's going to follow him and who won't. So, what will it be? Let's take a look at Joshua chapter 24. And this will be the end, I think. Verse 1. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers, and they presented themselves before God. And Joshua, and oh, by the way, this is how you pronounce what they say, claim as Yeshua. It's Joshua. And they'll say, well, there's no J in the Hebrew. It can't be Joshua. Uh, so you're telling me Jerusalem is misspelled? You're telling me Jews don't exist? Oh, the, well, there's no J. There's no J, they'll say. There's no J in Joshua. Well, I guess Jews in Jerusalem don't exist, right? Yeah, that's their logic. 
I love throwing this stuff in their face. And Joshua said unto all the people. Now Joshua's name actually means Savior or salvation. And Joshua took over for Moses after Moses died. And Joshua said unto all the people, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Your fathers dwelt on the other side of the flood in old time, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nacor, and they served other gods. And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. And I gave unto Isaac Jacob and Esau. And I gave unto Esau Mount Seir to possess it. But Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses also and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt according to that which I did among them. And afterward I brought you out. And I brought your fathers out of Egypt. And ye came unto the sea, and the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen unto the Red Sea. And there's actually people that will tell you, oh, well, the Bible's mistranslated. It wasn't the Red Sea. Uh, Israel crossed the Sea of Reeds, which is like ankle deep. And saying, well, that was the miracle. You know, they, they crossed the Sea of Reeds and they just walked across. And it was like dry land. But the real miracle is how did uh, Pharaoh and his army drown in a, the Sea of Reeds that was only ankle deep? Figure that one out. See, these people, they lie, but they can't think through their lies, you know. No, they went through the Red Sea and God parted it. Just like the Bible says. Verse 7. And when they cried unto the Lord, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians and brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes have seen what I have done in Egypt. And ye dwelt in the wilderness a long season. And I brought you into the land of the Amorites, which dwelt on the other side Jordan. And they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand that ye might possess their land and I destroyed them from before you. See, there's people who tell you that the uh, Canaanites were not the children of the fallen angels of Genesis chapter 6. You know, they, they want you to believe that uh, believing men marry unbelieving women and have giants with six fingers and six toes. And then God says, go kill them all. No. No. If these people were redeemable, God would have said, preach to them and tell them my ways. Tell them to keep my commandments and how the love of Jesus. But no, God said to destroy them. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and warred against Israel and sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not hearken unto Balaam. Therefore he blessed you still, so I delivered you out of his hand. And ye went over Jordan and came into Jericho. And the men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Girgashites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I delivered them into your hand. All the Canaanites, I delivered them into your hand. I gave them to you. And I sent the hornet before you, which drave them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, but not with thy sword nor with thy bow. Yep, I, the Lord, did this. Not your sword, not your bow and arrow. I did. 13. And I have given you a land for which ye did not labor, and cities which ye built not. They built the cities, not you, and I gave them to you. And ye dwelt in them. Of the vineyards and olive yards which ye planted, which ye planted not, do ye eat. See, they planted the garden, and you're eating the fruit of it. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, 
we will serve the Lord. Now, this is Joshua speaking. And the people answered and said, God forbid that we should forsake the Lord to serve other gods. For the Lord our God, he it is that brought us up and our fathers out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and which did those great things in our sight and preserved us in all the way wherein we went and among all the people through whom we passed. And the Lord drave out from before us all the people, even the Amorites, which dwell in the land. Therefore will we also serve the Lord, for he is our God. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If, if ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods. See, the Lord's a jealous, a holy and jealous God. You want to serve the devil, he's not going to, well, he's not going to, there's going to come a time he won't put up with it. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then he will turn and do you hurt. Oh yeah, he's going to hurt you and consume you. And after that he hath done after that he, had, he hath done you good. See, he's doing you good, but if you want to turn away from him, he's going to hurt you. And the people said unto Joshua, Nay, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said unto the people, Ye are witnesses against yourselves that ye have chosen you the Lord to serve him. And they said, We are witnesses. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. And the people said unto Joshua, The Lord our God will we serve, and his voice will we obey. Liar, liar, pants on fire. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem, well, maybe the, some of these people probably serve the Lord, but their descendants sure didn't do it. Our people. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day and set them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. And Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God and took a great stone and set it up there under an oak, which is by the sanctuary of the Lord. And Joshua said unto all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness unto us, for it hath heard all the words of the Lord, which he spake unto us. It shall be therefore a witness unto you, lest ye deny your God. So Joshua let the people depart, every man unto his inheritance. And it came to pass after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being a hundred and ten years old. And they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sirah, which is in Mount Ephraim, on the north side of the hill of Gash. Gash. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that out, out overlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord which he had done for Israel. And the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in a parcel of grand, in a parcel of ground, which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver, and it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. And Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died, and they buried him in a hill that pertaineth to Phinehas his son, which was given him in Mount Ephraim. You know, people, I think that basically says it all. And it's a test. Who are we going to serve? Are we going to serve the beast, the antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition? Or are we going to serve Christ? The man of sin comes first. Remember that. And if we're not caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, it's the wrong Messiah. I, I can't emphasize that enough. I cannot emphasize that enough. That, you know how many they don't teach this in churches. They don't. They just don't teach that. So, what can I tell you? 
All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.